Okay, we're good to go. So some of this is a repeat for some of you, but there's never a problem with repeating anything because repetition is what creates knowledge and keeps a lot of thoughts in your brain. So we're going to talk, the, the kind of like the overall theme today is the adelectas, adelectasia and retraction pockets. But I've thrown in some little caveats as well. And most of us, especially those that might not have a lot of experience, will see an ear like this and go, wow, compared to the normal eardrum, this thing looks really ugly. It's, it's not normal. You know, and our first intuition is, hey, we got to operate here. All right. Now, the hearing could be perfectly normal in this patient or it could be, you know, this patient could have a 30, 30 decibel hearing loss. Okay. But the most important thing in this ear right now is to see that here's a malleus, here's the incus, here's the stapes, here's the stapedius tendon. Okay. And this is, this ossicular chain's intact. So about the maximum conductive loss you're going to get in a patient like this with a normal, a normal intact ossicular chain is about 25 decibels. Yes, you've got an atelectatic ear, but that's not, that's a, a, a kind of like a secondary concern. And you can see the promontory, the round window, and this most likely is a big Jacobson's nerve here. Okay. So let's kind of move on. Now, here's a simple case. Now, the question is, do we operate or not? There's no doubt you need to operate. This is a cholesteatoma. By definition, and our understanding of the pathology of cholesteatomas, we know this patient's gonna undergo surgery. So the patient needs to be worked up, audiogram. If you wanna get a CT for whatever reason, that makes you feel comfortable or the patient has some underlying symptoms you don't understand, then get a CT scan. If you don't get a CT scan, you're not a criminal surgeon, as long as there's no clear indication to get one. And that's a whole lecture in itself. I put this together because we always need to listen to our patients. If you sit there with your hands crossed, your mouth shut, and you ask the patient about their disease, they will tell you what their problem is. Their symptoms and how long it's been going on will tell you what's going on with them. A draining ear with hearing loss for two or three years is significant. Drainage means an infection, either chronic otitis media or cholesteatoma. Two or three years evolution tells you it's progressive, especially when the patient tells you the hearing loss is getting worse with time. If the patient just tells you, hey, I only have a hearing loss and I've got family history of hearing loss, you know, without even looking at the eardrum, the first thing that should enter your mind would be like otosclerosis. So these are very, very important. It's very important to understand what the patient tells you. And you put that in perspective with otoscopy and you're gonna see either one of two things, a normal eardrum or something abnormal. Glomus tumor, perforation, cholesteatoma, carotid artery behind the drum pulsating. Who knows what you're gonna see, but you'll correlate these two. And then you'll go ahead and do an audiogram. You'll do your testing. It's important to do this so that you know what level before surgery the patient is operating at. And all of this gets supported by either a CT or MRI if you need it. Now this is a little, this is pretty much the same thing, but it kind of takes it to a next level. Our symptoms, our otoscopy, our audiology, our radiology. We're going up the staircases here and we make a diagnosis. Once we have our diagnosis, we know, hopefully, based upon our reading, 
our working with our colleagues and our own knowledge base, what we are going to offer in terms of treatment. We'll know what approach to do, transcanal, andoral, retroauricular, and we'll know what surgery procedure. Are we gonna do a tympanoplasty? Are we gonna do an atacotomy only? Are we gonna do a mastoidectomy? And there's lots of other procedures as well. But you know, it comes down, and I keep saying this, you gotta know your anatomy. That's why, you know, it's important if you have the opportunity to use a laboratory or even in your department where you work on a weekend, go in there, use the microscope you use to examine patients, get a temporal bone, find a drill, and drill some bones, even in your clinic if you don't have a lab, because you need to perfect the anatomy. Otology is a long process. It's not like dermatology. You don't even have to talk to the patient when you can look at their skin. Okay, you can, you don't have to talk to them. You're not doing otoscopy on a, on a patient with a skin lesion. You, you, might, you might do a biopsy and then you're done. And you put them, and everybody goes on steroids who's got a skin irritation. So that's kind of a facetious statement, but it's kind of, and a simplicity, but otology requires multi, multidisciplinary activity and knowledge much greater than most other fields in medicine. So we can just look at these eardrums. We know what a normal eardrum. So let's forget the normal eardrum. By just looking at these eardrums and knowing what the patient told you, you'll be able to figure out a lot before you even come to the position or choice that the patient needs surgery. In this case here, we're seeing on the promontory tympanosclerosis. Before I even talk to the patient, I can tell you that they're gonna have a conductive hearing loss, not only from the perforation, but most likely their ossicular chain is gonna be involved in tympanosclerosis. Do, what else do I know? I know that tympanosclerosis reoccurs in 50% or better patients. I know that I'm gonna you know, do an atacotomy. I'm, I know that I'm gonna probably encounter disease on the malleus and incus. And I know that the stapes hopefully should be mobile and I can put a, a porp in and do a, a ossicular chain reconstruction with repair of the tympanic membrane. By understanding the disease and how the disease acts, you, you organize your thoughts in terms of the surgery. Again, here we have another patient. This patient, this, this process that we're seeing here with, with uh, some serous media and an atelectatic drum did not happen overnight. It takes years for a drum to retract and to create a conductive hearing loss. So the patient tell, if the patient says this, I only noticed this you know, for the last two months, either they're not really together in the head or the fact is it came on so slowly over the years that they only just became unaware of it because they're getting older and maybe they're developing some hearing loss in the opposite ear. But a process like this, again, it takes years, years of evolution. And then a, a picture like this, uh, otoscopic view of the ear. We know we got a perforation. Was it, did the patient get slapped? Did the patient perforate their ear from some you know, trauma? Was it from chronic otitis media as a child? Who knows? But the, we can tell that the middle ear mucosa looks really good. It's healthy. We don't see thickening in the mucosa. The edges of the perforation, we can see it tried to regenerate here a little, but this is mostly scarred. And we're not seeing, unless this is the malleus, which is, this is probably the malleus, and that's the incus there, which could be. Um, the chain should be intact. So if the patient's audiogram shows a conductive hearing loss of 25 decibels or less, we can pretty much, pretty much, but nothing's ever 100%. We can pretty much delineate that this patient 
conductive hearing loss is due to perforation. If the patient's hearing loss is 50 decibels, it's a guarantee pretty much that not only is a perforation involved in creating the conductive hearing loss, but the ossicular chain. Because when you get above 25 decibels with a perforation of hearing loss, it signifies that there's a conductive component within the ossicles. So a lot of times we see retraction pockets, which are only a portion of the eardrum that lies below the normal eardrum position. And retraction pockets can be in the pars tensa or flaccida. Whereas adelectasia is a complete retraction of the whole eardrum from its normal position, and it only occurs in the pars tensa. And with either one of those, either a retraction or adelectasia, you can get hearing loss and you can go get cholesteatoma formation. Now, I know some of you have reviewed this before, but it's again, it's always nice to review. And let's talk about the pars flaccida right here, which is this area. And what makes the pars flaccida of importance is that it is a Sing, well, it's really two layer membrane. It doesn't have the medial layer, the fibrotic layer that the pars tensa has. So negative pressure in the ear from eustachian tube dysfunction will first affect this area, the pars flaccida, because we don't have three layers of support. Retraction occurs and we can get retraction pockets here. And it was in 1982 that Toss, I think he's a Northern European, uh, he's written many books and they're all really good. And he really focuses on conductive hearing loss and reconstruction. He came up with his own system, uh, grade one, two, three, and four. Okay, this is not gonna make you a better surgeon just because you memorize this, okay? What's gonna make you a better surgeon is understanding the pathology not telling me, oh man, Dr. Wagner, this is, this is grade three. You know, it's impressive to hear you say that. But to me, you know, my mo most con mo concern is, you know, did you look, is there cholesteatoma? Did you look at the bottom of this retraction pocket? And what's the hearing? Okay. You can have grade four. Okay, well, grade four is unreachable keratin. So by definition, it's got keratin. But you tell me grade three, and my, my, you know, I'm concerned, is there keratin accumulating, number one, and how long has the retraction pocket been there? If you saw this patient five years ago, and they came back, and nothing's changed, there's nothing to worry about. It's a stable retraction pocket. And if you've had it for five years, there's a likelihood of creating a cholesteatoma in the future is going to be really, really small. Whereas if you've seen the patient only once and you're questioning what's going to happen in the evolution, you tell the patient, hey, you know, this is what you got. It could stabilize as it is now, or it could advance to a cholesteatoma. You know, come back in six months or a year. Or if you develop symptoms of drainage or or hearing loss. Again, this is a slow process. So most likely a adequate treatment plan would be for the patient to come back in a year. Now on the other side of things, Sadie, another famous otologist, classified PARS tensa disease. And on otoscopy, there's stages one, two, three, and four. And again, it's, it's academic. It's purely academic. So let's look at atelectatic ears, okay? Sadie is our man here. So here we have an atelectatic ear. The eardrum is below the normal level of the annular ligament. You can see the annular ligament here, okay? And the drum is retracted. Again, Atelectasia only occurs on, in, the, in the pars tensa. 
It is a chronic condition. It is due to negative pressure sucking in of the eardrum, all due to eustachian tube dysfunction. The eardrum is intact. You can put water in this ear and there's no water going into the middle ear. And what happens is as this negative pressure affects the eardrum, the fibrous layer gets, it disintegrates. And it, the drum literally drapes over all the structures, the promontory, round window, malleus, incus, whatever is available. It's like taking cellophane, putting a heat, heat blower on it and watching the cellophane drop down as it gets heated and cover everything that's underneath it. This is a stable, this is a stable eardrum. There's some moringosclerosis here, but it's a stable ear. If you see it forming keratin accumulation because as the eardrum drops inward and drapes itself over the structures of the middle ear, there will be areas where, which will produce keratin. And especially behind blind areas, keratin accumulation can eventually cause the formation of cholesteatoma. That's why it's critical to either use the microscope or an endoscope and evaluate everything you can't see. And here's, here's, if you want to get real academic, you know, we can look at type one, two, and three of Sadie's. We can look exactly where the eardrum falls on the middle ear structures. And we can correlate this with otoscopic viewing and as well, pictures drawn, done by artists. I'm not going to review it because as I said before, the most important thing here is not type one, two, three, or four. It's are you forming cholesteatoma and how bad is the hearing? And we'll talk more about how bad the hearing is later. And there's a word that you might hear. It's called moringostapediopexy. It's nothing more moringo drum stapediopexy head of the stapes. And what we have here is the drum has collapsed in, it's become atelectatic, and it is sitting on the head of the stapes. So moringostapediopexy. This patient will have a conductive hearing loss. Ossicular chain looks like it's totally intact to me, but there's probably some erosion here with the long process of the incus, but the drum sits right on the head of the stapes. So we're not transmitting through the malleus and incus, but we're transmitting directly from sound waves that hit the head of the stapes. So this is called a moringostapediopexy, and you can see here a histologic section of this. It's kind of like more for academic purposes. So retraction pockets. Retraction pockets can be either in the pars tensa or flaccida. More commonly, we talk about retraction pockets when um, we refer to the pars flaccida. But we'll see large retraction pockets in the pars tensa as well. This is just for academic purposes. For some reason, there's the retraction pockets in the pars tensa are more common in the posterior portion of the tympanic membrane. Uh, there's been speculation because people have investigated this because the fibrous layer is incomplete as well as the vascular plot supply and it leads more to an inflammatory reaction and a creation of a, of a retraction in the posterior tympanic membrane. So retractions, okay, in the pars tensa, excuse me, in the pars flaccida, um, the TOS system that we talked about shortly, short while ago. I think it's easiest to look at this and to, to view, here's your retraction over the neck of the malleus. We go more posterior as we get more aggressive. This retraction will go up behind the sputum. 
and it will eventually go up into the epitympanum. And again, now we start to form cholesteatoma here. I believe the next slide, no, not that one. Okay, whoops. So we now start to form cholesteatoma because the keratin from the eardrum is not desquam, it's desquamating, it's breaking off from the eardrum as dead tissue, but it's not able to self clean itself. And what we'll have is the sputum, which is nice and pointy here, will become blunted. And one of the things we look for on CT scan when we have disease such as this is we look at erosion of the sputum. When you have a CT with erosion of the sputum, it tells you that there's a long ongoing process because we're losing bone. So here we've got six really nice retractions, each one different, but they're all epitympanic or pars flaccid retractions. Other than this one here, on the lower left corner. So I'll talk about these because I want you all to participate with me later on in looking at some drum. We got a retraction in the pars flaccida. The drum is normal. And one thing I have committed myself and another thing I have seen others commit is that when you do otoscopy, we have a tendency just to look at the eardrum and not move our microscope and the patient's head, or if we're using an otoscope, to move the patient's or to move the otoscope so we get adequate visualization of the epitympanum here. If we don't look here, we will miss disease. So there's two things on any otoscopy, irrespective of the instrument you're using. Look at the eardrum and confirm that there's no disease in the epitympanum. So the first case here, retraction pocket, pars flaccida, but we've got keratin. We've got keratin formation. You can clean it out. You can ask the patient to come back in three months, but I'll tell you something. If they've already got keratin now, they're gonna develop more keratin later on. It's telling you that the pathophysiology and the way this eardrum is reacting is going to form cholesteatoma in the future. This hearing might be completely normal. And when you tell the patient, you know what? You need a small surgical operation. Otherwise, you're gonna get a bigger one later on and your hearing might be affected. So you can do a small atacotomy, take the diseased tissue out, make sure you get rid of all the eardrum that's been retracted here, put some cartilage over it and a fascia graft. The patient's hearing should remain exactly the same as prior to surgery, which is probably normal. This one, I'm not really concerned about this. You can't see the end of the retraction pocket. It appears to be clean. And you take a little 2.7 millimeter zero degree scope and you put it in the patient's ear and you look at the distal portion of the sac. If you do not see keratin, this patient can come back and see in a year or 18 months. This patient, there is, it looks like cerumen. I would highly recommend cleaning the cerumen, using an endoscope, and evaluating the area in this retraction pocket to see if you have any cholesteatoma formation. And the most important thing is if you're in doubt, like in this case, if you cannot see distally, and especially if this patient says, I've had drainage or odor, do a CT scan because the CT scan will show you any disease that you're not able to see with an endoscope or, your, or the naked eye or a microscope. All right, here we've got a patient retraction pocket in the pars tensa. It's really a moringostipedial pexy. Normal drum here, retraction pars posteriorly, and we also have a retraction right there. So we've got 
Two retractions, pars tensa, pars flaccida. This patient's disease has been there a long time, a long time. And the most important thing in this case, it looks like we can easily see that there's no accumulation of keratin there. I do not believe there's any keratin accumulation here. So the real question for this patient is gonna be, what's your hearing? Now, if this patient's hearing loss is 20 decibels or less, I'm probably not gonna do a thing for this patient other than tell them, give them reassurance that there's nothing grave about what they've got going on. And if they really want to try a hearing aid, they could try a hearing aid. But if you try to operate on this patient for 20 decibel or 15 decibel loss, you're probably only going to improve them by five decibels. And in, in that range, the hearing is still normal. So the chances are the post-operative inflammation from the surgery or a failed surgery would make the patient worse. So my recommendation in a case like this was, would be to leave the patient alone or try a hearing aid or put a Baja on them. You can put a strap Baja on them and see if they function better. If they function better and that's what they feel that they want, you can, impl you can do an implantable Baja. But again, with the hearing loss below 20 decibels in this year, wouldn't do anything. And here, this is a good, a perfect example. Again, looking at the tympanic membrane and the epitympanic area. This patient needs surgery. There's cholesteatoma, no doubt about it. Here, it looks like we're, we're looking at a, a, the, a, the base of this retraction pocket looks fairly clean. I wouldn't do, <clears throat> I wouldn't probably have to do very much here. Um, you know, the keratin's accumulating on this post on this uh, anterior section, eroding the sputum, and along here. Here's where there's a probability of having more disease. Uh, looks like there's more of an inflammatory reaction going on on the mucosa of the uh, uh, sputum. So wind-up is you're probably going to do an atacotomy, cartilage repair, and, and fascia graft the hearing probably won't change. And the last one here, this looks like a fairly good sized cholesteatoma. It's probably going underneath the bone there. It looks like, or sputum I should say, and it looks like our posterior drum has a white color to it. I believe this cholesteatoma has gone all the way into the middle ear. The fact that it's gone into the middle ear from disease that began in the epitympanum does not make it a case where the ossicles are eroded. There, are, there is a chance the ossicles are eroded. Um, you could do a CT and evaluate that, um, but the most definitive way of finding that out is during your surgery itself. So this patient's gonna need a larger surgery of all these patients who are gonna be operated on. This one's got cholesteatoma in the epitympanum and in the middle ear space. So this is, this is like what's behind the scene. Here's your little perforation with retraction, or I should say your retraction. And any possibility exists as to the extension of the cholesteatoma. The most important thing, the cholesteatoma sac will go up, up to the tegmen. It reaches the tegmen and there's resistance. And what happens when there's resistance? You find the plane of least resistance. Everybody's ear is different. And it depends upon how much of the, and, and people who do endoscopic ear surgery are really interested in the inner ear folds. The cholesteatoma will track either posteriorly or anteriorly, depending upon the plane of least resistance and the folds in the middle ear. Most cholesteatomas, when they hit the tegmen, go posteriorly, because we find most of our disease eroding the bones and getting into the mastoid. I've seen numerous cases where we just have a small retraction pocket and there's cholesteatoma at the mastoid tip. So understanding that cholesteatomas grow, enlarge, and travel along the planes of least resistance. 
helps you to understand what you can expect when you do ear surgery. And it's really important to understand that small retractions, small retractions will remain stable most of the time in 50%. And in 30%, they'll just spontaneous resolve. So 80% of your patients that you observe with retractions, nothing will have to be done. It's this 20% that are the ones you need to pay careful attention to because they are going to go on potentially to form cholesteatoma. And obviously, the more severe the retraction pocket, the greater the chance of forming a cholesteatoma. And these retraction pockets, as I said before, you're gonna go up to the tegmen, the bone is hard, the plane of least resistance will now take you posteriorly as this cholesteatoma travels, eroding possibly the head of the malleus and incus, most likely not doing any damage to the stapes because many, many times we will fi find aggressive cholesteatomas, but the only ossicle remaining is the stapes. But anything is possible. But statistically, the stapes is not affected compared to the malleus and the incus. And the disease goes posterior to the mastoid tip. And here is a CT scan and I'm showing you, here's our cholesteatoma, just in the epitympanum, remnant of the drum, and we do not show a nice pointed sputum. So what do we have for treatment of these patients? We always have to ask ourselves, do we wait or do we act now? Will a cholesteatoma evolve? Will hearing be better or worse if we operate or we don't operate? And ultimately, are we helping the patient? So we've got a lot of options. We can observe with an endoscope, tell the patient come back six months to a year. Um, if we believe there's some medical therapy that might help these patients, especially children who are, have behavioral problems like sniffing, um, they might need a psychologist. Um, somebody who has chronic rhinorrhea, who, you know, who uh, constantly clears their nose and irritates their eustachian tube, these patients might need you know, allergy testing. Um, the role of ventilation tube, we'll get to that at the end of the lecture. And perhaps in a young child, who's got retraction of the eardrums uh, or, and the early adelectasia, they might need a tonsillectomy and an adenoidectomy because in the nasopharynx, the eustachian tube is blocking, or excuse me, the tonsils and the adenoids are blocking the eustachian tube, causing the negative pressure in the middle ear. Um, do we do a simple moringoplasty? Do we do moringoplasty or tympanoplasty with cartilage graft? Or do we do mastoidectomy? You need to understand that there's a host of different treatment options for these patients. And I only bring this up because the pediatric group, okay, has a different kind of, a different response to retractions than do adults. Small retraction pockets heal with excision only in 94%. So if you see a child with a retraction pocket, if you remove the retraction, 94% of them will heal and they're done. They're not gonna have to have any further treatment and they're gonna have safe years. And for those of you who are interested in the article, it was in the Journal of Pediatric Otolaryngology from 2008 and the, the citing is here. We're also recording this, so this will be on the YouTube channel for Global ENT. So here's some clinical cases. And the question is, what do we do? So I need every one of you to participate because I'm not gonna answer these questions. You're gonna answer them, okay? You've been, most of you are devoted to learning and improving your knowledge in the field of otology. And I need you to be able to answer these questions for me. So. Unmute your microphone, do whatever it takes to um, 
do whatever it takes to participate. But, you know, we're either going to say that we're going to observe this patient, put a ventilation tube in, adicotomy, cartilage, tympanoplasty, or mastoidectomy. Okay. You understand? So what I want you to do is help me out. So let's go ahead here in this patient. So who's going to, Agata, since you're already available because you're not, your microphone is open to discussion, tell me what we got here, first of all, if you can identify it to be in the right or left ear, what the pathology is, okay, and what your treatment plan is, okay. Any questions you have regarding hearing loss or patient's history, ask me the question and I'll tell you, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, so help me, Agata. Okay, which ear is this? It is the right ear. Okay, hold on a minute. It might be the right ear because my, I gotta turn the volume on my computer, hold on. Okay, I think I got that. Okay, so it's the right ear, okay. And what's our pathology here? We see almost normal uh, tympanic membrane in the pars tensa. Exactly. Only a uh, small uh, pocket in uh, pars flaccida. Okay, but we perfect. can't see the um, it is movable or uh, what is on the bottom of this uh, small pocket. Okay, absolutely. You're 100% correct in everything you said. So my next question is, how are you going to evaluate this retraction in the pars flaccida? What are you going to do, Agata, to make yourself comfortable with telling the patient that they need to see you back in six months or a year? Valsalva. Valsalva, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, what's the Valsalva going to do for you? We will see if the pocket is available. Okay, Valsalva. Uh, if you, okay, let me just make your comment. If we have a small pocket here and we Valsalva, and you can see that the tympanic membrane that's retracted here is mobile, that's, that's a very simple thing to do. But I don't think that the eardrum's gonna move in this region. So mm -hmm. what other tests or what can you do to get your view of this area that will help you be sure that there's nothing, there's no keratin collecting. Endoscopic. Endoscopic, exactly. You're gonna take an endoscope and you're gonna look there, okay? So your endoscope is, it helps you. You got either one of the two things is gonna happen. Your endoscope can see the whole area and there's no keratin, or you can't see the whole area. Okay, so if you can see it, you're not gonna do anything. If you can't see the area completely and you have doubt as to what is really going on behind this retraction, what are you gonna do? What's the next thing you'll do, Agata? Tomography. A what? CT, CT scan. Absolutely, you wanna do a CT scan to evaluate what you can't see. Okay, perfect, okay. Let's go to the next one. Okay, who's gonna be my next candidate? Uh, Azi, you there from Somaliland? Yeah, bro. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. good. You've got this patient. Tell me, tell me what the pathology is, okay? The pathology is in the attic, in, in the pars flaccida, and uh, there's a traction and perforation in the pars flaccida, and pars tensor is normal, so, uh, what I would do is also uh, falsafa and also uh, uh, endoscopic examination of the, the hole. There is a keratin over there. And also what I would do is uh, audiometry for hearing evaluation and as well as CT scan for if there is any cholesterol uh, term over there. Okay, I think one other thing you might want to do is clean this keratin. I mean, excuse me, oh. clean the wax out here. The wax. Okay. There's wax accumulating around the retraction. So, you know, everything you said is, is a good plan, but clean the, 
clean the wax out so that you can have a better view, okay? The other thing it looks like is, it looks like there's some moringosclerosis in the, in the drum here, okay? Because the drum really isn't real transparent. But it's, again, it, it just might be the way, the, it might be the way that- Sorry to interrupt the prof. Is it, does it look uh, timber sclerosis or is it look is some dull or something? There's a pus behind it, something it's tough. Is it I'm sorry, did you say pus? No, it's just, uh, it looks like the tympanic membrane like it's dull for me in my mirror, in my screen. Okay, it's probably it's just, a, yeah, it's, let's not worry about, let's just say the tympanic membrane's normal, okay? Okay. okay. All right, good. Okay, Great. good job. Okay, so let's move on. And Artem, Artem is unmuted. Artem, can you join us? Yes, Artem. thank you. Good, Hi. thank you. Thanks for joining us. So Artem, tell me which ear this is. This is left one ear. Uh, we could see uh, a little bit intellectatic uh, part stanza and uh, big, uh, big retraction pocket. Uh, the the flat that we can see erosion of the uh, lateral wall of the attic. We also could see uh, big intellectasis in the uh, inferior attic, um, but with no uh, wax. This is like uh, yeah. Here we can see here we can see cholesteatoma, and neck of the medulla, handle of the medulla. Yeah, this is uh, this is as for me. This is cholesteatoma. Exactly. Uh, We've got cholesteatoma, and it looks like the head of the malleus is eroded. Um, that's yeah, it could the, be. That's probably the head of the incus. So, what are you gonna What are you gonna do next? You've identified a cholesterol in the left ear. What's your next plan? Next plan to uh, to form atico uh, mastoidectomy, find the end of the cholesterol. Um, okay, you're gonna, you're gonna operate on this patient. Okay. Uh, are, yes. you, are you going to get a CT before surgery or not? Uh, sure, yes, yes. Okay, that's that's purely... 100% I will, I will perform my CT. Okay, um, that's your choice. That's your choice. I wouldn't do a CT scan, but that's your choice because I really believe the disease is limited to the area and the epitympanum, and the CT is not going to help me do anything further. Um, but that's fine. Um, when you do reconstruction in this area, assuming you just have to drill out here a little and the disease only goes to here and you drill that out, is there anything special you need to do in your reconstruction of this area? Uh, uh, we will perform, uh, we could perform, uh, we could take uh, cartilage and perform reconstruction of the attic wall and also we could, we could take a lot of bone and perform uh, mastoidoplasty and atticoplasty to uh, obliterate the attic. Okay, absolutely. Everything you said is good. I would, myself personally, would not take bone. I would reconstruct this with cartilage from the concha and put fascia over it, okay? Yeah, so and also I'll watch the you know, uh, round uh, uh, oval window watch the uh, stapes, if the stapes or if the no stapes, and also maybe perform um, a cycloplasty. Right. I don't know. Depending it depends, on. it depends, depending what, what in the old window we could find. Exactly. We will find. Exactly. Because to reconstruct this area with cartilage, your graft is going to have to go underneath the malleus. This drum is going to have to be stripped off of the ossicular chain and the graft will have to be tucked in underneath the drum remnant to cover your cartilage, okay? All right, thank you, Artem. Um, we're gonna move on now to the next one. Um, this is Asuk, Asuk in India. Asuk, can you unmute your microphone and join in if, if you're there? Asuk, hi Asuk, nice to see you. Hi. Asuk, can you tell us what ear this is, right or left, and are you gonna do anything to it? 
uh, there is no picture of a tympanic membrane on my screen i am not getting the picture of a tympanic membrane i'm sorry say that again i'm not hearing you asuk yeah which is this the right ear me? or left ear i am here the right ear this is the right ear okay and then Maybe what's the what's i'm the, not getting the picture of a, that a tympanic membrane there is no picture get, on my screen you're not getting the picture okay ah uh, yeah okay sorry to sorry you can't answer it then if you don't have the picture so let me move on to karen are you there karen yes i am here hi karen nice to nice to hear uh, your voice karen could you tell us what ear this is our right ear we know that um, yeah okay and can you tell us what the pathology is you know is this atelectasia is this retraction no it's looked to me like atelectasia exactly this is a completely atelectatic eardrum there might be a little residual drum there but it looks like everything else is atelectatic okay and then what would you do for this person Let's say they tell you their hearing is fine. Are you gonna, they come in, my hearing is fine, that you look, do you tell them, what do you tell them? They need surgery or further observation? Uh, if, if the person say the hearing is fine, I could say it's observation. Absolutely, observation. Now let me ask you another question. If they say their hearing is really bad, okay, like, they're telling you that they can't, it's like the hearing's at 40 decibels, 40 or 45 decibels. What kind of options do you have, Karen, for this patient to improve their hearing? Uh, I, I call uh, amiringotomy or uh, with uh, ventilation too. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. That's not a really good option here because a ventilation tube is not going to do anything for this patient. This 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 drum is not going to return to normal. Second of all is here's our stapes foot plate, and here's our facial nerve. We yeah. do not yeah. we, have, we do not have a stapes. We do not have an incus. So if we try to put a ventilation tube in this patient. And let's just say for some odd reason, the drum returns to normal. We're still lacking a stapes and an incus. So we're still gonna have a huge conductive hearing loss. Okay, so okay. it's not a really a proper option here. Um, patients got a 45 decibel hearing loss. They've got two options. Okay, if, help me with this or I'll answer the question for you. So I guess the question is, if we're not going to put a ventilation tube, what's our other option? Yeah, it has to be a, a surgery, has to be a, a reconstruction of the ossicular chain and, uh -huh. and, 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 and the tympanoplasty. Correct. So we could put a, we could put a torp in from the foot plate, take out all this residual atelectatic drum, put a porp in, put a nice piece of cartilage over this, and then mm -hmm. reconstruct with fascia. That's option one. What is option two? For, uh, for the ossicular chain to reconstruction? Yeah. Uh, it? With cartilage, with cartilage. Okay, exactly. With... But if we, de if we decide yeah, not to do better. surgery, how can we improve the patient's, uh, how can we improve the patient's hearing? We can put a Baja hearing aid on them, okay? Okay. We can put, do a, yeah. we can put a Baja on and it will bypass this and all the sound will be transmitted to the inner ear, okay? Right, yeah, okay. okay. So those are the, the options. Again, you've got to remember, as I said to you all in the beginning of this lecture, it's not only what the patient tells you, it's what you see, it's what you find on radiographs, and it's what you find on audiograms, okay? All right, thank okay. you, Karen. Appreciate it.
Okay, so time is kind of running out. I'm gonna, a lot of these are repetitious, but I think you guys are getting a picture. We can look at these l later on. Um, we're gonna look at these last two, okay? And I think you guys are starting to get a good feel for, you know, using all your tools, history, exam, audiogram, CT to make your plan as to what you're going to do. So we've got, who do we have here? Oscar. Okay, we're going to unmute Oscar. Oscar, are you there with us? Uh, yes, yes, I'm here. Okay, so this is a patient. This is the right ear. This is their left ear, okay? Mm -hmm. So we've got a right ear, left ear. So tell me what you see on the right ear. Tell me what you see on the left ear, okay? Okay, so the left or right? Uh, uh, so right ear, it looks like, uh, it looks like the I, I cannot see actually the ossicles and it looks like the facial nerve is, uh, is uh, transparent uh, through the tympanic membrane. Correct. There's the facial nerve, there's the foot plate. Mm -hmm. um, there might be part of the long process of the malleus. Okay. What is yeah. the disease process here? Uh, the disease process. Okay. Some... some this whole area of the drum, what's going on here? Uh, is this a retraction pocket or is it atelectasia? It looks like a retraction pocket. Okay, we could call it that because it looks like we've got kind of like normal drum here. Okay. If mm -hmm. you said either retraction or atelectasia, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't beef about it. Okay. So we've got no ossicles. We've got a retraction pocket. What's this here? Uh, this, uh, this actually might be the, uh, the head of the malleus. And, and uh, er, 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 it's, we can see this because of the erosion of the sputum. So it looks like there's some mucosa overlying the head of the malleus. It's a little mm -hmm. inflamed. Do you see cholesteatoma here? No, I cannot see. Okay, fine. So now we've got this patient. Okay, let's not worry about the other ear for now. But this patient's ear, um, so they got, they're telling you that they can hear normal. They can hear normal. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do for this patient? Uh, do the audiogram to understand what's the uh, hey, hearing. Just, Maybe there is a large... Uh, conductive hearing loss, maybe there is a sensory neural hearing loss and the, the, the patient okay, they, is not noticing They this. told you they could hear normal and your audiogram shows a 10 decibel hearing loss. What are you going to do? Or 15 decibel hearing loss? <laughs> or 20 <laughs> decibel hearing loss? I probably will not believe you. <laughs> the audiogram. I'm not believe it because the <laughs> probability without an ossicular chain, their hearing loss is not going to be, they're, hear, they're going to have a hearing loss and it's gonna be greater than 25 decibels. Okay, so what options do you have to help this patient hear? Now, if they're telling you they can hear good, you're not gonna do a darn thing to this patient because they're telling you they can hear. It doesn't matter if you disagree or not. If they can hear and they're happy with it, you leave them alone. Because if you start operating on them, their hearing is gonna change. But let's say they say their hearing's down. What, what, what kind of options do you have for this patient? Uh, so, uh, so one option is to, uh, in terms of surgery, is uh, to perform, uh, uh, in case of the present foot plate, total secular uh, chain reconstruction, put the prosthesis on the foot plate and then maybe fix to the handle of the malleus or if it's still present or maybe just put the cartilage on top of the prosthesis and uh, cover with the uh, tympanic membrane. Okay, and what other, what's your second option? Uh, hearing aid is always the option and uh, 
is especially usually patients with conductive hearing loss they have a, a very good work recognition score so the the hearing aid is another option and I the Baja may be also one of the options so you have a regular hearing aid or a Baja okay those are options um, okay now let's go to this year what's what about this year Patient tells you that they can't hear at all. Oscar, you have a bird? I'm, I'm, my dog is playing with uh, like a Oscar, you toy. Can, you can take your dog and put him in another room because it's irritating. One second. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, uh, so this year we having uh, some parts of the tympanic membrane is a uh, myringo sclerosis, especially in the anterior superior quadrant. We can see some uh, handle of the malleus and the short process. There is a retraction pocket in uh, pars uh, flaccida and uh, some white color substance. It looks maybe. Mm, this here is your, what you're talking, white color? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. What do you think this is? Cholesteatoma or tympanosclerosis? It doesn't look like a cholesteatoma, uh, so maybe that's also the uh, ringo, or maybe the tympanosclerosis that are, uh, we can see through the uh, tympan It's tympanosclerosis, okay. Early tympanosclerosis or developed tympanosclerosis? This is tympanosclerosis up here, and we have sclerosis in the drum, okay. Mm -hmm. So this, and, patient, this patient's telling you that they can't hear and they've got a 35 decibel hearing loss. What, are you, what kind of options does you do you have for this patient? Okay, so, so maybe because the ossicular chain is fixed, especially if we can see the tympanosclerosis in the uh, pars flaccida region, maybe the uh, head of the malleus uh, or the incus or both, they are fixed at this area. So we can, uh, what we can do, we can uh, elevate the tympanic membrane and check the stapes if it's mobile. And in case if the stapes, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm doubt that we can uh, mobilize the incus or the malleus uh, if we can see the this uh, tympanic sclerosis through the tympanic membrane uh, so what we can do maybe uh, divide the head of the malleus from the handle and try to attach the uh, the porp uh, from the stapes uh, to the, uh, the handle of the malleus or maybe just do the uh, the uh, pork uh, and uh, put the cartilage on, on top of the pork. All right, this case, you know, first of all, if the patient doesn't complain about much hearing loss, you're going to leave the patient completely alone. If the mm -hmm. patient complains of 35 decibel, 40 decibel hearing loss, unless you're a very skilled surgeon in removing tympanosclerosis and you're competent in ossicular chain reconstruction, you're going to unless you're competent in all those, you're gonna put a hearing aid on this patient. All right, this gonna probably require significant ossicular reconstruction and, this, and, the, and the where for all, in other words, when you take patients with any form of delete disease where there's evidence of eustachian tube dysfunction with atelectasia or, re, or retraction pockets, you need to use cartilage to reconstruct the drum because you need to prevent the atelectasia or the reformation of the retraction pocket. So it's really important to remember that. We can look at some more, uh, some more images another time. So this is gonna just, this kind of like a summary. It tells you about the pathology, atelectasia, retraction. The only time a eustachian to a, a pressure equalization tube is gonna really help you is if you have like, Sadie's one or two atelectasia and you think that you're going to help reventilate that ear and that the drum has not undergone enough um, enough atresia 
okay? Or I should say uh, atrophy, not atresia, but atrophy. When your drum at level four, when you have a complete atelectatic drum and it's sitting on the promontory and draping over everything, even if you have a little residual drum, normal drum at some location, putting a tube in is not gonna bring that drum back out. The only thing a tube is gonna do is to prevent further evolution of adlectasia. So if, again, in early, early phases, a tube is warranted, okay? And that's it. If you try to put a drum in an adlectatic tympanic membrane, you're going to tear the tympanic membrane because it's a single layer of thickness. And now the patients can be subjected to not being able to wash their hair, go swimming, and you've done them a real disservice. Because that cellophane, as I remember I told you, you take a, a piece of cellophane and you heat it with a, a, a hair dryer, it's, it becomes thin. It becomes very friable. And putting a tube is not going to, you're not going to get a tube in. You're going to tear the drum. You're going to tear the atelectatic drum. So there's a very limited role of, um, there's a very limited role of putting a, a pressure equalization to. All right. So listen, thank you, everybody. We have sight, we have exceeded our time. Um, and uh, I appreciate you. I hope you guys got something out of this. Um, Again, you, you've got to learn to put everything that you've learned in the last six or eight months together and apply your knowledge to, to treating ear disease. Um, next week's lecture, hold on a second. Next week's lecture will be, hold on a second here. Just a second. Next week's lecture. Okay, next week's lecture is Dr. Weiderman, um, November 13th. He's doing a, some of the people who in Ethiopia, and we don't have any Ethiopia people here today, but Josh was a, Josh is a uh, ENT from George Washington University who did a uh, one year kind of like sabbatical in um, Mekula, Ethiopia, spending a year there. Now he's doing training in public health at I believe Mayo and he's gonna give us a lecture next week on his international experience and his experience with ear disease. So it should be a good lecture next Tuesday, okay? Um, in the meantime, any questions or if there's any particular subject you guys wanna be lectured on, um, put it in the chat and I'll make sure I find somebody to lecture on it or else I'll do it, okay? So in the meantime, um, Thanks for joining today. Hope everybody got something out of this. But again, you gotta go through a thought process. You gotta start learning enough and using all your resources to make you feel comfortable about ear disease, okay? All right, listen, have a good week. Uh, hopefully we got a new president by the time we all rejoin next week, all right? All right, stay safe. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Prof. That's You're welcome, speaker.